Hello VC community. So this is another video featuring some of the music I've listened to yesterday and today. So I'd like to start with an album that I really like. Um, certainly one of my favorite albums. Um, and there is a whole bunch of reasons for that. It's an album by Gong and it's called Downwind. Now all the Gong experts are going to scream now because this is of course not the proper Gong. It is the Pierre Morlans gong, and uh, now uh, I'm not a gong expert, but gong experts will tell you that uh, the gong album family is a highly complex uh, sort of a rhizomatic uh, tree that has all kind of branches, and uh, this is the one uh, branch of the gong family uh, that came up in the mid. 70s and uh, lasted a couple of years and a couple in some albums that well sometimes it gets a bit criticized for not being proper space music and whatever i just love this album this is really wonderful i mean this sounds so great now uh i think um i think the guys that made this and uh, it was really a mixed outfit, mostly of French people and um, um, American musicians. And um, now there are all kind of uh, supporting names here that uh, play on this record. Like, uh, well, what about Steve Winwood? Mike Oldfield? Oh, Mick Taylor. Let's get Mick Taylor. <laughs> so that's some great musicianship here. I was always thinking... I mean, um, just bear with me here. Um, the the music of the late 70s started to discover the synthesizers and a certain way of presenting chords and uh, and harmonics, oftentimes with sort of a octave-styled um, staccato. All the music keeps popping up with the really clear-sounding synthesizer music that happened in all kind of uh, uh, repetitive patterns. Um, I don't know if I make any sense right now, but I try, I try. Now what they did, and that's my point here, they just kind of removed that and brought in xylophones. Xylophones, glockenspiegels, vibraphones, and did exactly that kind of a sound uh, timbre with these instruments. So it sounds very modern, it has a sort of a uh, almost a sort of a post-punk uh, quality to it, but it's beautifully designed with these uh, with these percussive instruments, um, which of course the core members of the band uh, were quite experts on. I mean, Pierre Morlan and his brother Benoit were both not only drummers but percussionists in the broadest sense of the word, um, and that's what they did, uh, and they created this wonderful music. Now, uh, the genre of this album is most obviously fusion, jazz and prog rock. Now, what really sticks out here is the work of Hansford Rowe. Hansford Rowe is an American bass guitar player that uh, came to France to work with uh, Pierre Morlan. Um, that's him here. And uh, I must say he sounds really wonderful on this album. I mean, this is such a fresh, dynamic bass guitar playing. I really liked it. Um, yeah, but this is the kind of album I can hear it all the time. And um, it always, it's always very, very satisfying. I mean, you have a, first of all, the stereo mix is wonderful. You kind of, you kind of hear this, I mean, these, all these vibraphones and xylophones, they beautifully cut through the mix. So it's a very clear sounding album. Uh, there's sort of no no acoustic mess, um, which I mostly do not appreciate. Um, so yeah, great album. I can really recommend it. And uh, their next album uh, was Time is the Key, which is this one. Um, now Time is the Key follows the same principle, the same in the same vein. I don't like it as much as the previous one, but it's still a great album, really enjoyable. I have here a 
picture of Pierre Marlin surrounded by his gongs. Yes, so finally the band Gong became a band using a lot of gongs, which is kind of a strange irony, isn't it? <laughs> um, here the group. Um, now on this album it's Alan Holdsworth on the guitar. But those are all really great musicians. Um, this is nice firm paper here. This came out on Arista. Arista logo. So, yeah, great. So I kind of like this uh, this uh, percussive uh, French uh, branch of the gong music. Now, um, I prefer it to the traditional gong. Because I'm not too crazy into space rock. Now I don't mind space rock and space rock can be very interesting. But sometimes some space rock records are a little bit like, I mean, wherever you drop the needle, it's just this endless solo guitar and noodling, which can be nice for a while. I mean, I'm the last one to be against it. But um, when I heard this for the first time, this was really a positive surprise. This was so fresh and so dynamic and so full of new musical ideas and I don't think there are many rock records in the world that have put these kind of instrumentation in the middle in the middle of uh, of, of a band sound so this is highly original and and really really listenable so I think I've said enough positive things about it didn't I <laughs> so uh the next one and you already know I like him is uh Poisson d'Avril by Yukihiro Takahashi. Now this is a bit of an odd bird in the catalog of Yukihiro Takahashi because it is a movie soundtrack. This is a soundtrack to a Japanese comedy called Shigatsuno Sakana, which translated means the same as uh, Poisson d'Avril, um, which is a sort of a West European uh, expression of, of, uh, of April first April Fool's pranks and stuff like that in a wider context now um, um, so this is a bit of a I mean the there are some let's say uh, typical Yukihiro Takashi songs on it but there are also more of those snippets and themes um, that uh, are part of the movie but even if some of it is a little bit uh, peculiar, it's never obnoxious enough because it takes only 30 or 40 seconds. So I like to listen to it. It's a good album. What I like about it too is that I got this in a really wonderful condition. And it's really like new, like it was never used before. It comes uh, and uh, Takashi Records oftentimes have some interesting things inside. So it comes with the Yukihiro Takahashi poster. And I have to move back to show it because it doesn't fit in the camera otherwise. So did we get there? Yeah. So uh, that's nice. Okay, let me fold it back. Um, now this came out on Yen Records. Um, which I believe is uh, somehow affiliated with the with Alpha, so it has a really nice label. As I'm about to show you. Let's see in the records. Yeah. Um. Also, there is a. Uh, this sheet inside with lyrics and of course the back side I think I forgot that so that's another album by Yukihiro Takahashi and finally I've been listening to some albums by Rick Wakeman um, mostly um, his uh, last two albums he did for A&M, which is uh, Rick Wakeman's Criminal Record and uh, his uh, 
Rhapsodies. Oh, let me take it one by one. First, I mean, Criminal Record is really a nice album. Um, it's not a... Let's not call it a concept album, please. Let's not call it a concept album. Yes, each of the tracks is somehow related to sort of a forensics and criminality. Uh, but that's not enough of a concept, right? Um, there's a nice leaf photograph here of some forensic liquids and stuff. So you get in the right mood. Now, um, musically speaking, this came out um, at the th at the same time when Wakeman was recording uh, "Going for the One" with Yes. So, uh, in in a sense, it's like a little little kind of wake many yes album because i mean the people playing on it is like a little like a core core outfit of yes it's ellen white on drums and chris choir on bass so it's like this three piece they also have a frank ricotti playing percussions and that's all um now of course it's filled with mini moogs and poly moogs and uh, and, and harpsichords and uh, all kind of hammond organs and uh, it features the famous Byrotron that most of the people have no idea what it is. Um, but it gets mentioned again and again as a sort of a um, 70s effort to create a new Mellotron that never basically took off. And so there seems to be only a handful of Byrotrons in existence and one of them in the possession of Rick Wakeman. Now this album in my opinion, follows a similar, uh, similar uh, style or, or musical concept as his first album, Six Wives of Henry VIII. So, which means it is not as uh, pompous and crazy and outlandish like his journey to the center of the earth, um, which can be a good thing, I believe. Um, I mean the. The, the the A side is musically very coherent, while the B side is not coherent at all. I mean, the B side is is completely uh, unrelated music on its style wise. Like the first song on the B, B side is basically just a piano track, while the last one is um, this huge uh, or uh, choir project uh, that takes like twelve and a half minutes. So. Um, yeah, I, I like stuff on it, um, but uh, I probably wouldn't listen to it too often. Now his last a and album was Rhapsodies. Now this is a double album in a gatefold sleeve, um, so that's what it looks on the outside. Yeah, sort of uh, alpinistic atmosphere. On the inside this is a rather famous uh, picture which one could argue is in uh, questionable taste but that's Rick Wakeman for you <laughs> um, um, it's a double album and to be honest it's hard to understand why would somebody make this a double album because uh, while a lot of these songs are quite interesting some of them some of them not so much you just don't get the uh, the impetus to create a double album um, well, I would speculate that Wakeman's contract with a and was running out, but he still owed them maybe two albums. And so maybe he came and said, yeah, if I give you a double album, are we even then? Can I get out of the contract? So, um, so he kind of padded this together <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> to make it big. Because, I mean, back in the day, that's a general problem. Now, let's, let's take a little... Let's take a little tangent here. The reason why I like the classical sort of vinyl album structure is because I believe that uh, like 35 to 40 minutes, it's a wonderful length for a musical project to listen to. That means after 20 minutes, you have to get up, turn over the record, but that's kind of good. 40 minutes, yeah, and you can go and listen to something else or do different things. Now this has completely changed when the CD came and suddenly the, the bands uh, regarded the CD the main product. Now the CD allowed them to put like 7, 65, 72 minutes on it 
and uh, suddenly all these all these albums became far too long and let's be honest uh, a lot of these bands they don't have this kind of uh, uh, creative energy pouring out of them to put together really 65 minutes full of great stuff so oftentimes it's it becomes too lengthy and too uh, well almost too annoying and there are many good CDs where you realize yeah I actually only know the first 50 minutes because that's as far as I get and I never hear the songs in the end because a average CD today with 65 minutes music on it is basically a, it's a double album by the standards of the 70s so but in the 70s if you said I want to do a double album there had to be a reason for it like we have so much good material or this is what we need to say and it needs a double album um, so it was always something special now while this is an interesting album and I'm not trying to kind of slug it off um, yeah I, I think one could have one could have made a really snappy one disc album out of it and leave the other tracks for another day <laughs> but that's not what happened so yeah so the Rhapsody is this kind of a, a giant thing uh, which doesn't sound that giant to me but don't get me wrong there are some nice tracks on it yeah so um, that's Rick Wakeman on a and the last time and uh, let's also I do this later that's also my stack for today so i hope you liked it and um, see you next time bye bye